Amazing. It looks like we have people all over Ann Arbor. I grew up in Ann Arbor. Awesome to see you here. Arlington, that's where I was born. Um, I'm just grabbing everywhere that I have a personal connection to. It's so great to see so many different destinations. I just saw Tanzania as well, St. Louis, Virginia, Georgia. Um, welcome everyone. British Columbia. So great to have you here. Um, if we have not connected before, um, my name is Kelly and I am the founder and executive director of Impact Travel Alliance. Impact Travel Alliance is a global community and nonprofit for conscious travelers. So we teach travelers how to explore in a way that has a positive impact on local communities and our world. Um, so I'm so excited to have our guest here today. Um, this is our first online event after a summer break, um, and it's going to be a very special one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Paige, our moderator. Paige is an award-winning American travel journalist based in France. She's a regular contributor to the New York Times, and she's also the creator and host of the Better Travel podcast. She's working on a book about the travel industry to be published in 2024. And I will pass it off to Paige to let her introduce our two incredible speakers. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Kelly, for the introduction. And thank you to you and your whole team at Impact Travel Alliance for hosting this event today. Um, I am honestly so excited to have the chance to serve as a moderator here. And I am just delighted to see so many people joining us for this conversation about travel with purpose. So we have two fantastic speakers today. And I've been lucky enough to interview both Rick and Disease for dedicated Q&As in the New York Times, as well as for my own travel podcast. I've also read and enjoyed their books, um, which I have here with me. <laughs> and earlier this year, as part of my research for my own book on the tourism industry, I traveled to Israel and Palestine where I joined Mejdi Tours. So I had the chance to see Aziz in action as a tour leader as well. So Rick and Aziz have very different backgrounds, but they share a vision for travel that I find really fascinating. And they've both written these books that really encourage us to think about our travels as political acts or as acts of peacemaking. So I'm really hoping that we can all come away from this hour we have together today um, with some inspiration and some ideas for how we can all think about our own travels in a deeper and more meaningful way. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Rick Steves is a popular public television host, a best-selling guidebook author, and an outspoken activist who encourages Americans to broaden their perspectives through travel. He is the founder and owner of Rick Steves Europe, a travel business with a tour program that brings more than 30,000 people to Europe every year. Rick's newest project, Rick Steves Art of Europe, is a six hour series that follows the entire span of European art history. The series will premiere on public television in October. Also with us today, we have Aziz Abusera, who is a National Geographic Explorer, Ted Fellow, peace builder, author, and co-founder of Mejdi Tours. Aziz is the recipient of the Goldberg Prize for Peace in the Middle East, the Eisenhower Medallion, and the European Parliament's Silver Rose Award. His tour company, Mejdi, is a leader in responsible, sustainable travel, and it originated the dual narrative approach, which uses tourism to bring people together across deep divides in places like Israel and Palestine, Ireland and Northern Ireland, Vietnam and Cambodia. So um, two very impressive bios there. Um, and I would like to start the conversation by asking each of you guys to share a bit more about how you got to where you are today. Um, and Rick, if it's okay, my first question is about your evolution as a traveler. Because you know, Rick, I knew you from your TV from your TV specials, which I enjoyed watching on PBS as a kid in the 90s. Um, and I have to say, I was a little surprised a couple of years ago when I came across this book, you know, Travel uh, as a Political <clears throat> Act, which you wrote, um, which didn't exactly line up with this image that I had of you in my head from TV as a kid. Right. So Rick, can you tell us about you know, how did you go from being a sort of how-to guy for travel in Europe to writing a book with such an overtly political message? Well, you know, I've written 50 books and I think the most impactful book I've read, written is the one you just held up, Travel as a Political Act. And I didn't have a grand plan, but all I've known is that ever since I was a kid, I've loved to travel and I love to teach what I love. And the only other job I've ever had is a piano teacher. So I love piano and I love music and I love travel. 
And um, uh, at first, I would just teach anywhere I could back in my 20s, uh, teaching people all the tricks of budget travel, you know, how to catch the train, how to stay in a youth hostel, you know, how to make a smart itinerary. And um, I've been teaching travel ever since. And I didn't have a grand plan, but I noticed now looking back over the decades, there was a progression in my teaching. And it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of travel needs, if you can think about that. At first, it was the basic skills. Then I thought, hey, there's more important stuff than catching the train. You can do that. Here's the book. How, let's experience and appreciate history and art and culture. And that's like, I, I just produced this six hour TV show about art. So that was, I wrote a book called Europe. At first of all, it was Europe to the back door, skills. Then it was Europe 101, history and art for travelers. And then I'm giving lectures all over the country. They're hiring Rick to come and talk about travel, thinking I'm going to talk about finding a nice cafe or going to the museum and so on. And I'm more and more inspired to talk about the political lessons and values of travel. And I was disappointing some people and exciting other people. And I decided I should not just call this Europe through the back door or, or how to travel. I should call it uh, travel as a political act. So that's really the pinnacle of my teaching. And it was an evolution over 30 years uh, of realizing what do I want to share? And what I want to share is the very top of Maslow's hierarchy of travel needs, if we can call it that. And that's traveling in a way that gets you out of your comfort zone and uh, gives you an empathy for the, for the other 96% of, of the world, if you're an American, and helps you come home with the most beautiful perspective or the most beautiful souvenir. And that's a broader perspective. So that was sort of uh, what I want to talk about is what's more most important about travel. And that is having a transformational experience and becoming a person with a global perspective and especially for Americans becoming less ethnocentric and uh, more tuned into the realities on this planet so that's what gives me the most joy and it's just great to be here with you and and with Aziz to talk about how travel can be something we do uh, for a very important uh, uh, reason along with recreation travel on purpose Absolutely. Um, well, fantastic. That's a wonderful way to start this conversation. Um, and Aziz, I have a background question for you as well. Um, so you came to the travel world from a very different starting point. Um, just before you and your business partner, Scott Cooper, founded Mesh Tours in 2009, <clears throat> excuse me, you were doing conflict resolution and mediation work in places like Afghanistan and Syria and Palestine. So how did you guys go from doing that kind of work to deciding that you wanted to found a tour company? I think they're very connected. And that's what, uh, that's what we realized. Uh, in the beginning, maybe it wasn't clear to us, but slowly as we work in places like Afghanistan, like Syria, like, uh, like Vietnam, like wherever we were going, uh, we were realizing that our work really is about connecting people. Conflict resolution is all about connecting people, making people overcome their stereotypes, overcome their misunderstanding of the places or the people who live in a certain place. Sometimes they're next door neighbors. Uh, and as we did work in some of these hard, intractable conflict zones, we realized, wait a second, if we can do this in Afghanistan, why are we not doing this in other places around the world? And then the more important question that we had to face is, how do we take our work in conflict resolution and take it into something more sustainable that we don't need to apply for grants every couple of months? We don't need to be asking money from everyone to do this work. And we looked at different industries and travel mm -hmm. seemed to be the most, um, the, the most reasonable one. It seemed the right choice uh, to, to take our ex expertise in those places and base it in travel. We started working in Jerusalem in the beginning because that's a place me and Scott knew the best. I grew up in Jerusalem. I had many experiences in Jerusalem. And we thought one of the things that happen in tours in Jerusalem is that people just come and usually will know one narrative. Uh, and so we decided to challenge that by doing two tour guides, again, bringing people from opposite sides, have them talk to each other, have them work together and present those two narratives and not only political narratives, cultural, historical, religious, so many other narratives that's often missing. And the moment that worked out, we started going from one place to another and seeing just amazing things happen. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, 
So my next question is for both of you guys, and I would love to just try to unpack the, ti the title of this event, which of course is Travel with Purpose. Um, because of course, you know, we can all travel to Disney World with the purpose of like getting a selfie with Mickey Mouse, right? But that's not really what we're talking about here. Um, so maybe starting with Aziz this time, and then Rick, you jump in when you're ready. Um, what does travel with purpose mean to you? This is really good. When I was preparing for the book, I was finding all these sayings about how travel used to be without a purpose uh, or used to be always with purpose until the, the last century. It used People used to travel for religious reasons or for trade, and that's it. And now people travel with leisure. And I think that's not necessarily true. Uh, to me, travel with purpose is, yeah, you can travel and have fun and all of that, but also you are traveling to challenge yourself. You are traveling to learn. You are traveling to step out of your comfort zone. You are traveling to grow as a human being. That's what's traveling with purpose. But And most importantly, is making or understanding that as you travel, every act you do make an impact, makes an impact on this world. You are a peacemaker as you're traveling. The way you treat people, the way you choose where to go, who you're talking to, these are uh, purposeful choices. And when you do it in this way, you're not only impacting yourself, you're impacting, you're impacting a whole community that you're meeting. And when you go back home, you're impacting also the community around you when you go back home and tell those stories. So we change the way we interact with each other. Mm. And I just have so many, so many amazing stories of those kind of travels and how it it has changed me as a human being. And I believe it has changed so many people around me. Wow, I love that answer, Aziz. <laughs> it's so great to hear your perspective. You know, you. Um, I, I know that when you make a book, you are in, we're, all, we're all inclined to be inspired by inspiring quotes. And, and there's millions of quotes, it seems like, from great travelers through the ages. And one of my favorite is about 1500 years ago, Mohammed said, don't tell me how much you've, how educated you are, tell me how much you've traveled. Uh, I don't know if he said exactly that, but I think it's pretty clear in Mohammed's uh, uh, teaching is that you need to get out and see the world. That's why, that's one reason why you wanna go to, to Mecca or do the Hajj one time in your life, I think, is to get away from your home. You learn a lot about your own home when you look at it from a distance. And that's something, you know, I live in the most powerful and dominant and inclined to be ethnocentric country on the planet, I think. And uh, we really think we're the norm. And when we travel, we realize we're the, we're, we're not the norm. I was going to say we're the oddballs. Well, we kind of are, uh, but we think we're the norm, which is fascinating. And I love to have to help travel to be, um, to be um, transformational. You know, a lot of people use that word, transformational travel. Uh, but what does that really mean? And it, it really does mean to learn about yourself as well as the rest of the world. I mean, to me, there's tourists, there's travelers, and there's pilgrims. And, um, you know, I, we don't all need to be saintly in our travels and just be a pilgrim, but you don't need to be a silly tourist only. Sure, take your selfie. Sure, go to Disneyland. But also you can be a traveler, which is learning about the rest of the world and curious and trying new things. And you can be a pilgrim which is learning more about the meaning of life or why we're here or how can we be better citizens of this planet. And I think the kind of travel we're talking about today, travel on purpose, is that kind of travel, raising it up, making it more than a chance for privileged people to go get a tan where you've got cheap margaritas. I, yeah, I, I think we... Uh... We have definitely very, very similar <laughs> perspective. And, and I always tell my friends, like, if you want a beach, you don't need to travel 7,000 miles away. You, <laughs> there are a lot of good beaches probably close by. You don't need to, right. to spend so much money on a, on a so far. But if you want to experience a culture, if you want to hear a right. story that is different, yeah. then yes, travel is the most amazing thing. So you shared your favorite, one of your favorite quotes. I'll tell you mine. Everyone who knows me knows this is a quote I always say. It's, uh, it's Ibn Battuta's quote that travel makes you speechless and then turns you into a storyteller. And ah. to me, that's the power of transformation because yeah. you take somebody's stories, you hear that story, you, mm -hmm. you understand it, you live it, you feel its pains, you feel its joy, you feel everything that comes with it. And that's, 
you know, travel isn't only about feeling the good things. You also hear some some stories that might not be yeah. uplifting and good, and we yeah. should be willing to hear those stories and to internalize it and reflect on it and, and see what's our role in this world and how we can sometimes help or at least learn from it. And then you can come back and share that story and you become a storyteller from that place you visited. I've never done this before, but I'll bat another uh, quote back to you now in response to that one. Thomas Jefferson, who's near and dear to the hearts of so many Americans, said travel makes a person wiser if less happy, if, if less happy, if less happy. Now that's an interesting thing. And, and uh, I thought that's actually quite thought provoking because when you travel, you learn about things that make your life more complicated. And then you have to decide, am I going to be involved in this? Do I really care about somebody south of the border? Do I really care about somebody who's struggling, who's not in my tribe, you know? And um, I love that about travel. Travel makes us wiser, if less happy. That means we are having a travel on purpose experience. It makes our lives more meaningful and it makes us more connected. Connected is a cool thing about travel. I, I, when, I, when I look at, I just wrote a book called uh, For the Love of Travel. And uh, I, I swept through the 100 essays in that book thinking, what, what ties it all together? And the theme was connected. Uh, we are all connected in our travels. And when we get away from our home, that becomes just a sparkling reality, which I, I really value. Oh, well, fantastic. I'm loving this back and forth between you guys already. Um, and I'd love to just steer us a little bit towards the question of the overlap of travel and politics, which is something that's already come up a bit in the conversation. Um, but I'd love to explore in a little bit of depth how you actually integrate politics into the tours you offer. Um, and I wonder if we could use maybe Ireland and Northern Ireland as an example, because of course, you know, this is a place with complicated politics and a recent history of violent conflict. It's also a place where both of your companies offer tours. So what strategies do you use to engage your guests in the politics mm. of this place? And what kind of reactions do you see from them? Um, so I don't know who would like to go first here. Rick, feel free. Well, thanks, Aziz, I'll jump in. I, I've long enjoyed taking people to Ireland on our tours. And way, way back when the, when the troubles were still pretty hot in, in, a, in, in the news, I had an ethic of never taking a Rick Steves Europe uh, tour to Ireland without going to both the Republic and the North. It would not be correct to go to Ireland and just go to the Republic any more than it would be correct to go to the Holy Land and not go to Palestine. Um, you, you've got to see both. If there's a wall, there's two sides to the story. You cannot understand the wall without talking to people on both sides. To me, it's critical and it breaks my heart when people go uh, to Ireland and, and just talk to Catholics or when people go to the Holy Land and just talk to Christians. Um, I, I really love trying to understand that there's two sides to every wall and there's a lot of walls on this planet and there's a lot of fear and uh, what comes with fear is building walls. Think of America right now, the dynamic in America. Everybody on one side wants to build walls. Uh, they're the most frightened people. They're generally people without passports who have not traveled, whose worldview is shaped by hysterical news media. And uh, they're frightened people. They think everybody's out to get them. They want to build a wall. And there's other people that really believe the most constructive thing to do is to build bridges, bridges or walls. Well, we have to make that decision. Those who travel are more inclined to build bridges. Those who are fearful, I think, are fearful because they need to get out a little bit more. The flip side of fear is understanding, and we gain understanding when we travel and we get to know people on the other side of the wall. Now, in is in in uh, Ireland and in the Holy Land, the two most the walls that come to mind right now, those walls were built to, built with the um, rationale that one side needed to be safe from the other side. Um, the unintended consequence of those walls in both cases, I believe, is, is really sad. It's the younger generation on both sides of that wall does not have a chance to talk to each other as freely as they should, and they are saddled with their parents' baggage. And when they're saddled with their parents' baggage, you just get more fear and more status quo. If you could breach that wall and make bridges and young people could talk to each other, 
they'd realize how much we've got to uh, benefit from understanding and living together. That was one of the keys of how Ireland solved its problems. I mean, people on both sides of the wall, you know, Protestants and Catholics or, you know, loyalists and Republicans or whatever you call it, people that wanted Ireland to be one or people that wanted part of Ireland still be ruled by London. They had summer camps where kids from both of those communities got together and just played with each other, got to know each other. And it undercut the fear and it made peace possible. It's a beautiful opportunity. In, uh, I, I fully agree. In, uh, in a panel I did once with Betty uh, Williams, the Nobel Peace Laureate Irish, she said she started a school, one of the first schools that had Catholic and Protestant kids together. And these kids couldn't get out of their minds that they are Catholic or, or Protestant. And she wanted to show them that the world is bigger. So she brought a Buddhist monk to speak because she thought that's as different as you can imagine. And the Buddhist monk came and talked to them for like an hour and then he left and she got the kids together and she asked, what do you say? And the kids were like, yeah, he's weird. He's different. He's this, like his clothes, all of that. And then one of them raised his hand and said, but I have one question that I can't still get my head around. Is, Buddhist, is this Buddhist monk Catholic or Protestant? <laughs> And I kind of love this story because it shows how entrenched sometimes we can get into our boxes yeah. and how hard it is to get out of it. So I've, when, after we started tours in, in the Holy Land and challenged this whole concept of one, one narrative, to me, Northern Ireland and Ireland were the first places we had to go to. Uh, one of the first, because it's just the similarities. Actually, when you go and see the Peace Wall, which is an absurd name for a wall because it, it's definitely not a peace <laughs> um it's a it segregates two communities but when you go to that wall you see israeli and palestinian um graffitis some pro-israel some pro-palestine i'm like right. you guys have enough problems you don't need us to be involved in your issues but it felt so right for us to start working there mm. and i've spent i think eight nine years i spent few weeks in ireland and in northern ireland first starting to understand what, what are the narratives that people don't hear? What are the voices that people don't hear on their tours? I found out back then that vast majority of travelers that go to Ireland, to the Republic of Ireland, do not go to Northern Ireland. And one of the main reasons, and this is years after the peace agreements, is fear. Right. To me, that's important, just like you mentioned, Rick, you, you can't really go to Ireland and not go to Northern Ireland. You're missing so much. You're missing oh, so much yeah. of the story. Yeah. Um, the way I decided to develop our tour, especially in the Northern part, is having a Catholic and a Protestant who are very involved in peace building in the political affairs there to co-lead the trip together. The last trip I did uh, had uh, a former prisoner who was Catholic in uh, yeah. uh, for fighting against the, the English and uh, a reverend who was Protestant, who is being honored for his peace work, co-lead that trip together. Mm -hmm. And it, through the trip, we tried to just meet so many people, not oh. only political people. When we met politicians from the DUP and the Sinn Féin, those do not like each other. We met journalists who kind of come from both sides of media understanding. We met families of people who lost, um, members in in the conflict we met professors who talk about conflict resolution we met artists uh, storytellers and try to just make the place connect to a story mm -hmm. because it's easy to forget a place you there's so many beautiful things in ireland mm -hmm. so many but i think it's easy to go and forget it after you have some cool photos and that's it the stories you hear of these people will make you never forget it and, and that's our purpose. Aziz, did you notice in Northern Ireland, in the different communities, you can see Palestinian flags and you can see Israeli flags. And I got were... free drinks on the Catholic side <laughs> and there, uh, wasn't so welcome than the Protestants. Being a Palestinian, <laughs> Catholic sides were much more welcoming than the Protestant sides for me. And conversely, you know, uh, the Israelis will have a, a, an empathy for the struggle of the Protestants in Northern Ireland, what they both have in common, I think, is plantation. You've got 
Protestants that were planted there by London centuries ago to give up an English foothold in Ireland for political purposes. Protestants moved into the Catholic country. And today we've got settlements in the West Bank planted there, I think, by Israel to help give Israel a, a sort of a, a plant the flag there. And it puts the people who are planted at a disadvantage. And that plantation could be centuries old. People are still paying the price for planting people for political purposes. And when you talk Absolutely. to people in either community, you find there's beautiful people that are victims of their own political heritage. And when we travel there, as you're a big proponent of with a dual narrative approach, you learn about that. And that's a, that's travel on purpose. And then we become more clued in. I think one of the great innovations in, in Belfast these days, and I was so happy to put that in my, my newest guidebook on, on Ireland, is these dual narrative taxi tours in Belfast. In the old days, you just took one taxi and he would yeah. drive you around and he'd either be Protestant or Catholic and you'd get his take on it. Now you have companies that have Catholic and Protestant cabbies from those two communities. And I hesitate to use the term Catholic and Protestant because they happen to be those religions, but it's it's political and, and economic more than a religious fight, you know, uh, but that's for e for simple terms. And what you do is you do your tour with two different guides. You have a, a Protestant cabbie taking you through the Protestant neighborhood, and then you have a Catholic cabbie taking you through the Catholic, and you get the dual narrative. And then we get to um, come out of there with a balanced perspective and we have a better understanding. A fantastic. Well, I'm enjoying this conversation. I'm just going to jump in to kind of guide us um, along the way here because I see the hour is ticking by. Um, I'd love to ask you guys each a separate question about your tour offerings. Um, and my first question is for Rick, um, because I know you've written and made television programs about travel to places like Iran and the Holy Land and Ethiopia. And I think you say that your favorite country in the world is India. Um, if if that's right. Um, mm -hmm. And yet your tour company offers tours only to Europe. And I've asked you this before, and you've said that you're not thinking of expanding to other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. But I guess my question is, um, you know, after your Rick Steves travelers come back from their sort of, you know, mind opening trip to Europe, do you find them eager to travel to some of these maybe more adventurous parts of the world? Well, I like to think so. Um, I haven't done a follow up, you know, survey, but for me, Clearly, Europe is the wading pool for world exploration. And our mission as a company at Rick Steves Europe is to equip and inspire Americans to venture beyond Orlando. And I got no problem with Disneyland. Go there two or three times. But then try Portugal. It's not going to bite you. It's cheaper. It's probably safer. And it's certainly more uh, impactful. Uh, and then it opens you up to the beauty of the whole world. Uh, as a corporation, as, as the owner of a corporation, I like to measure our profit, not in how much money do we make, but how many perspectives do we broaden? How many people have, 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 a, have a transformational travel experience? And for me, I just focus on Europe because, um, well, it's my heritage. It's my expertise. I got a degree in European history. It's my passion. I've spent 100 days a year in Europe ever since I was a kid exploring. And I like to think of, well, it, it's a big market, to be honest. Every That's where Americans are going to go. So there's a chance to sell a lot of books and sell a lot of tours. But really, it is the gateway to world exploration. And even Europe can, can challenge us quite a bit. So uh, just the big leap is for the average American to get a passport and go to some place that doesn't think the world's a pyramid with the United States on top and everybody else trying to get there. Yeah, and I know. I think um, you said that your travel, your tour to Turkey, is one of the favorite, one of the favorite, well, your favorite ones that you offer um, of all of yeah. your tours. Well, that's that's just exactly right. I mean, that's I love uh, introducing Americans to Islam because our 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 experience with Islam, typical American, is what's given to us on commercial news media. I mean, what do people know about Iran? They learned about it from Ted Koppel in the hostage crisis, you know, 20, 30 years ago, whatever. And that's just tragic. Uh, the time I had uh, traveling in Palestine, when I traveled in Iran, you know, when I've traveled on the bus across Asia, that was the most beautiful travel experience because I got out of Christendom. I got I got a chance to get together and and uh, hang out with people who find different truths to be self-evident and God-given. Uh, in our world with the 40 itineraries that we offer on our tour program, Turkey is the chance to break out of Europe. And uh, 
and now there's complications in Turkey because of Erdogan and his move to the right and the in the same side they got you know Muslim nationalism just like we got Christian nationalism I think in our country but um, historically Turkey has been the ideal for progressive Muslims in more theocratic states and so on. And uh, Turkey is a pluralistic state. It's Western looking. It, it really is passionate about the separation of mosque and state, just like we try to defend the separation of church and state. And um, at the same time, it's 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 a devout Muslim culture. Uh, it's a beautiful experience to go to Turkey. The you know the one tour I'm sure that I took my parents on and all my loved ones was the Turkey to uh, the, the the trip to Turkey. We'll, we'll have at some point to travel together and do a travel with you and see how you do it and you travel with me and see how we do it. We'll bring Paige with us. I hey. think that'll be fun because I love Turkey as well. This will be a lot sure. of fun. Well, I um, love the fact that you do the Holy Land, Aziz, and I want to connect with you on that because it's one of my frustrations. I don't do the Holy Land because it takes an expert and it sounds like you really know what's going on there and, and talk about I'd uh, be happy to host you. Great. You tell me when, I'll be happy to host <laughs> Okay. You. Stay tuned. I, I Absolutely. You know, I love what you said about Europe because I think one of my challenges once in a, in a conference, I was speaking at, about the idea of dual narrative and one of the experts on travel in Europe stood up and told me this dual narrative, understanding different culture stuff, that works in war zones. But we in London do not have dual narratives which i thought was absolutely crazy because <laughs> i can share 10 narratives but there's a mindset that when you go maybe to europe maybe you don't need more than one narrative there's there's you know if you go into london there's just so much of a one narrative you can you can go to the british museum which in itself is multiple narratives but mm -hmm. you can go see the archaeology and ignore the history behind it you can um, you can ignore the homeless in the streets, even though you can book a tour that mm -hmm. actually can tell you the narrative of the homeless there. You can ignore so many things, the immigrants' stories, which London has just so many people who've come from all over the world that connected to colonialism back in the day, especially. Uh, and yet this person was so blinded and he worked in tourism and said, oh yeah, um, there there is no... No, no narratives. It's it's the normal. And I think a lot of people travel to Europe in that way. Aziz, you could go to London with five different guides and see five different cities. You could write the book on London and you could go to London with a guide with a different angle and you'd realize, oh, that's a different city. And I think totally that agree. is so exciting. Yeah. Totally agree. And I think that's everywhere in the world. There is no place that's homogenous and there is no single narrative of any country I can think about. And why wouldn't you have an appetite for that kind of challenge to your preconceptions? You know, I just it really bothers me when so many Christian groups go to the Holy Land and they, you know, they go to the Sea of Galilee and they do all the, you know, the Garden of Gethsemane and all this great stuff. And then they're going to go into the West Bank to see Bethlehem because you got to go where Jesus was born and they make a bee for two they, hours. Yeah. They, they make a beeline to the, the church, the nativity there. And then they, they rush in and they, and they see the spot where Jesus was supposed to be born. And then they get back on their bus and they go back to Israel and then they breathe a sigh of relief. That is so wrong. It's so, it's, it's, it's so un-Jesus like as it's well. Un, it's un -Christ like And, uh, the, and the irony is, uh, if they do meet a Palestinian, who happens to be a Christian, they say, oh, and when did you become a Christian? And they go, oh, it was about 2,000 years ago. <laughs> 2,000 uh, years our family has been Christian and we are Palestinians. Uh, I when, just love that. When I get invited to speak at churches, I usually tell them the story of Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman as he was traveling from Galilee. And Samaritans used to be enemies of Jews at that time. And I say, you know, when Jesus traveled on his pilgrimage, he traveled through places that were uncomfortable. He met with people. He talked to even people that nobody wanted him to talk to. It was breaking every norm. Yeah. And that's how Jesus did pilgrimage. And yet you want to come to Jerusalem and only have one person, your tour guide, to talk to? That's not really pilgrimage. That's sightseeing. It is wrong to call it pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. And I try to push that idea is you cannot call your trip a pilgrimage if you're not meeting Muslims, Jews, Christians. Meet with an imam, meet with a rabbi, go to a church service. Oh, These amen. are important things to do. 
Amen. My, one of my favorite experiences on our Turkey tour is we get to go to an, a mosque in Cappadocia and we sit cross-legged on the carpet and we have a question and answer time and we can ask this imam, Amazing. what are the challenges in his community and so on. One of the most powerful experiences for me was to go to the mosque. Uh, what's the mosque on, on the same square as the Church of the Nativity? The, there's Omar. A, Omar's the, Omar, the Omar Mosque. Yeah, I went there and I met a beautiful cleric and 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 we sat and we talked and we learned and and uh, I was so inspired and I didn't know I would be inspired in Bethlehem on Nativity Square in a mosque and that mosque has been there and and uh, you learn the importance of Jesus and Mary in the Quran and you learn how much we have in common and you come out of there very thankful that you got a dual narrative approach to the Holy Land. I know, Paige, you want to move forward, but can I say one more thing? <laughs> Sorry, I'll try to be quick. Um, <laughs> you mentioned Turkey earlier, and one of my favorite things to do on a tour in Turkey is talk about the history of Crusades, because people often assume it was a war between Muslims and Christians. And if you dig just a little bit, you find that Orthodox Christians fought with Muslims in the crusade against Crusades, uh, and then later in Constantinople, when Muslims conquered uh, the area, there were many Christians who fought on the side of Muslims and many Muslims who fought on the side of Christians. Mm -hmm. And it was never a war only of religion. Sure, religion was part of it, but it wasn't only religion. And that always shocks people. It's like, wait, you had, there was a Christian, um, even in the Umayyad dynasty back 1400, 1300 years ago, there was a Christian army that fought under a cross uh, banner in a Muslim, in the Muslim military. And people oh, yeah. normally get surprised. I'm like, yeah, because we like to make things black and white. We like to say it was yeah. always Muslims versus Christians. We always hated each other. And that's not true. It, it correct wasn't. Me, correct me if I'm wrong, but in Bethlehem, isn't there a, there's a, there are laws to protect the Christian community. And yes. I think the mayor of Bethlehem has to be a Christian. Christian. So by for the rest of time, decree. the, the yeah. mayor of Bethlehem will be Christian. Even if there's only 10 Christians in Bethlehem, it's gonna, one of them is going to be the mayor. Wow. And if the mayor is Catholic, the deputy mayor has to be Orthodox. And if the mayor is Orthodox, <laughs> the deputy mayor, mayor has to be Catholic. So we respect both communities. Travel, travel and learn. It's so exciting. Okay, Paige, back to you. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, thank you guys. Uh, uh, fascinating, fascinating sort of back and forth here. So thank you for all of that. Um, before, but before we get too late in the hour, I would love to turn to this question of how we as sort of individual travelers can kind of actualize some of these big picture ideas we've been talking about, you know, transformational travel, travel with purpose, you know, when I'm sitting down and planning my itinerary for my family summer vacation, you know, next year, what should I have in mind? What should I be thinking about? And, you know, both of you offer some really specific guidance in the books that you've written. Um, Rick, you say that we should travel like a medieval jester. Um, Aziz, you should you say we should travel like peacemakers. Um, but what are some really specific tips or words of wisdom, pieces of advice that you can offer for, you know, the, us normal travelers who are trying to plan transformational experiences? Aziz, go for it. All right. I have a few. Um, and these are things I practice when I travel alone. Uh, and I try to inspire our <clears throat> travelers to think about. One, ask a lot of questions. Mm. Just ask questions. Do not assume you know the answer. Do not think your questions are stupid. Ask questions with a curiosity to learn, not to argue. And if people answer things you don't like, don't fight with them. Listen, try to hear where they're coming from. Ask about questions that make them share their stories and not only their political views. Positioning of politics isn't how you know somebody. Ask them how they got to where they are. I think that's to me the number one. The number two that's very important is radical listening. Um, regardless, again, of what people say, try to listen to what they say rather than thinking of how to respond. You are there a guest in their home, in their country. Try to understand where they're coming from. And honestly, like all of us, I have my own political views and I meet, I just came from Poland. I'll, I'll just quickly share this. And I met this guy who was a big fan of Putin. And my first instinct was to go, but, and then I realized, I want to understand why this guy loves him so much. And so we sat down and talked and it didn't change my mind, but I understand where he's coming from. And then he was willing to hear me when I had something to say. 
and mm-hmm. understand where I'm coming from. But first I have to listen before I start talking. And those two to me are the most important. Finally, do find someone that you disagree with or somebody who has a different mm-hmm. culture, different experience. Don't only go to things you yeah. know what they are. Try at least one thing that is mm-hmm. different. So true. So good. You know, I find it's important for us to go, if, if we if we have the opportunity, go places we're not supposed to go. You know, why does my government not want me to go to Cuba or Palestine or Iran? Those are the richest travel experiences I've had. And uh, assuming times are peaceful enough to go to these places, I think it's wide open for tourism. Pe- Americans don't realize that the number one tourism destination in the Caribbean for Germans is Cuba. One of the best-selling guidebooks the Lonely Planet has in that part of the world is to Iran. A lot of people go to these countries, even if Americans think they are forbidden. And when you do have a chance to travel, realize that we are just as interesting to the people we're visiting as they are to us. So uh, you may not be very interesting if you go to Venice because people just see you as a part of the economy. If you go to Amsterdam or if you go to Barcelona, you're just part of the mob scene and they're, they're putting up with you to make some money, to be honest. But if you go to places where you're not supposed to go, if you explore Palestine, if you go to Cuba, Man, oh man, you're the most popular kid on the block. Everybody wants to talk to you. <laughs> and I just love it. If you want to have it easy, hire a guide. Now, there are the typical tours are just going to take you for fun in the sun and the beaches. But I think Aziz is, is working with an organization called Impact Travel Alliance. And that's a collection of tour companies that are traveling on purpose. There are the most impactful travel experiences I've had as a tour member is when I go on what I call reality tours. Every time I go to Central America, I've been there four times, I go with an organization called um, Center for Global Education and Experience from Augsburg College. And it is a reality tour company. And you go there not to lay on the beach. You can do that. That's no problem. Buy your fun souvenirs. But you do that to talk to people, to get the dual narrative. When we were in Nicaragua, we had to buy both newspapers. And our guide told us there's no fair newspaper in Nicaragua. This one has this politics and that one has that politics. Buy them both and read it. And then just wherever we travel, travel with a mindfulness that as tourists, we're inclined to go down to the bridge where all the tourist shops are and the English menus are. I was in Mostar, which was the most you know, tragic uh, scene in the war as, as the Baltics or uh, yeah. as the Balkans were as Yugoslavia was figuring, sorting things out after when they had their war there. And leaving my hotel, I was inclined to go to the famous bridge in Mostar. And I decided, no, I'm going to go the other direction. The guidebook has no information on the other direction, but I just want to walk into the neighborhoods. And I found a a brand new restaurant open for two months, right on what was the front line of this tragic conflict. And the, the courageous man and his family were starting a restaurant there. People were, were learning to live together. Uh, kids were playing. There was the, this competing cacophony of church spires and Muslim minarets. And I was in this community and I was talking to people and I just had the riches experienced. And I could have gone where the tourists were, but I made a point to learn and go where the real people were. And that's fundamental. So it's doable. You can do it on your own. You can do it whether you're going to pretty normal sort of mainstream places, or you can adventure into places we're not supposed to go as tourists. But the the opportunities are huge and the rewards are are, are just fabulous. Amen. Mm-hmm. Well, fantastic. And just, um, oh, sorry, Kelly, did you want to jump in with... Um... Some questions I am going to jump in now. Yes, time just flies. Um, we have about 10 minutes or so left. Um, I did want to make sure that we left some time for Q&A from our audience. Uh, we already have a lot of questions that have been coming in. Before I dive into those, um, feel free to share them in the Q&A or the chat, um, and I'll read through as many as possible. Um, but I did want everyone to know um, that all attendees will receive a free chapter from Aziz's book, Crossing Boundaries, A, Travel- a Traveler's Guide to World Peace. Um, and then in addition to that, Rick has also extended a 30% discount to two of his books, Travel as a Political Act, as well as For the Love of Europe. 
Mm -hmm. um, there are limited supplies of travel as political act. Um, so the offer is applicable while supplies last. Um, Kelly, so those, yes. If, excuse me, I, I didn't realize this was going to be a, of such a wonderful celebration of this kind of travel. I wrote a book after my experience in Guatemala and Ethiopia about looking for the roots of hunger. And I have the book available for free as a PDF on my website. So it's called uh, Hunger and Hope, Lessons Learned from Ethiopian Guatemala. If you have a follow-up email, you're welcome to mention that. And anybody who goes to my website, they could go into the TV section and look for the show about hunger in Guatemala and Ethiopia, and they will see that PDF. And it's a, a book that's packed with the lessons that I learned there that are right in tune with what Aziz and I have been talking Amazing. about. Amazing. Rick, Amazing. every time you, you talk about one of these places, I'm like, oh, I want to talk to you about what I did there and see who we know <laughs> oh. and how we work there. I love Guatemala. Worked there for a while and it's an amazing oh. place. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get on your <laughs> website and download the PDF. Thank you. And, and read it. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, we'll make sure to include that in our follow-up email. You'll have all of these links, the code. Um, I'll drop it into the chat right now as well. The code is IMPACT for 30% off um, for those two books between today and Sunday. And I'll send those links via email as well as in the chat. Um, thank you, Amy, for sharing that PDF already uh, in the chat. Um, and then let's dive into some Q&A from our audience. Um, I do have our first question. It's from Anna. Great to see a familiar name here. Um, I know that Anna is based in Brazil. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. She asked, um, would you say that religion and politics can have similar impacts when relating to travel? Hmm. Well, when I get hired to give a talk, it's either called travel as a political act or travel as a spiritual act. You can almost swap in and out the words. And it's a fascinating sort of exercise just from your own personal philosophy and so on, how the road can be a uh, school or the road can be church or mosque. And uh, I think there's a, a wonderful uh, spiritual dimension to travel as well as political when you're talking about travel on purpose. I agree. So I give more space for other questions. Um, we have a question from Sue who asks, is it enough to come back and share stories? Is personal transformation political enough? And what about creating change in political activities? She went to Nicaragua in 1985 um, and in support of the Sandinistas. That said, go back and change the U.S. It... I think for different people, different places and lives, there are different parts of what you can do. To some people, sharing stories is in itself a transformational act. Some can do more, some can do less, and that's all right. Um, I remember hearing this story from an Israeli author named Amos Oz, where he said, if you're walking by a building on fire, you have three things you can do. The first thing is you get is you run away because you see a problem, you run away from it. The second thing is you create a committee to investigate what should you do with the fire, which by the time you finish, everybody in that building or who started the fire. So by the time you finish, everybody would be dead, which is what we often do. Let's figure out who do we want to blame and whatever problem we see around the world. And the third, he said, you get a bucket, you fill it with water and you throw it in the fire. But what if you don't have a bucket? You get a cup, you fill it with water and you throw it in the fire. But what if you don't have a cup? He said, you get a spoon, you fill it with water and you throw it in the fire. Now, one person with a spoon will never be able to put out a fire. But the idea here, there are 1.5 billion people who travel internationally. 1.5 billion. If we get a fraction of that number to start carrying their spoons, and each of us does what we can. Some of us might have a bucket. Some of us might have a cup. Some of us can only share a story. Some of us can donate. Some of us can volunteer with an organization. And on these tours, we mm -hmm. try to introduce you to a variety of things you could do. Mm -hmm. If each one of us does that, if we're really able to transform the travel industry as a whole, you have changed the whole world. This is the one industry that has more power than I believe any other industry. It's the largest Mm. interaction that you can have the largest educational system that you have in travel so yeah stories might be not the only way but it's definitely an important part sharing stories because you're inspiring others to learn and hopefully they'll decide to act as well 
You know, I, I agree with the Z's. Of course, uh, travel is a force for peace. I went to a convention at that title up in Canada way back when I was a kid, and it just really had an impact on me. I w in the in the old days, I went to Nicaragua during Sandinista Contra times and so on, and I was concerned about the stewardship issue. I'm spending all this money to go down there as a privileged, rich, white American, and I'm going down there just to learn. What is is that an ethical thing to do? And if I just go there and for my own interest, it's questionable. But if I go home with what I learned and share that, and I don't mean just tell stories, I mean, make people uncomfortable, ruin a few dinners, you know, confront people about what America is doing south of the border, then travel becomes a very good uh, example of stewardship. And uh, the, the big issue for me is when we travel, we take home what I think is the most beautiful souvenir when we travel thoughtfully. And that is a broader perspective and an empathy for the other 96% of humanity. And when we come home, to me, what makes travel a political act is, is exercising that new awareness as a citizen of this great and powerful country that we live in. And that means going into the voting booth and not doing the conventional thing, what's, make, what, what, what's, what's in my interest? Am I better off than I was four years ago? That really doesn't matter. Who wins this election is going to affect people south of the border far more than it's going to affect me. And when I go into the voting booth, not because I'm uh, some sort of a, 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 a you know saint or something like that, I'm just an enlightened uh, citizen of the planet through my travel. I vote not for what's good for me, but what's good for the world, what's good for poor people, what's good for people south of the border, what's good for the future, what's good for the voiceless. We need through our travel to come home and be a political force for what is just and what is right. And the irony is, I've learned in my travels that even if you're motivated only by greed, if you know what's good for you, you don't want to live in a, in a, a filthy rich in a world with desperation and poverty. It's not a nice place to raise your kids. You want to invest in justice and peace because that's stability and that's good for everybody's future. So there was a great conversation that was happening in the chat while you all were speaking. Um, and I want to just share one portion of it. Marinelle did say, um, I just wish to note that we need to be more inclusive in our thinking when it comes to travel and deem any country different from ours worthy of the first place to travel to. Um, so thinking about these concepts of um, unpacking our personal identity and privilege when it comes to travel um, and also um, getting outside of what is a Western or often white centric view um, when it comes to exploring our world. Um, so I wanted to gain some insights um, in terms of what what are your thoughts around this as a whole? Um, how do we unpack our identity and privilege when it does come to travel, knowing that we are born into these systems um, that are often unjust, um, but we're also looking to explore in a way that is conscious and mindful? Yeah, I look, I grew up with no passport, so I totally understand where that question is coming from. I could not travel to most places in the world uh, growing up. Um, it was terrible. And as now I'm able to do that, I have to keep reminding myself that now I have privilege that my family does not have. My parents do not have. My brothers do not have. They can't. And my parents try to come and visit me in the U.S. I'm in Jerusalem now, but I'm in the U.S. often as well. And it was a nightmare getting them a, a, a visa to come and and visit me. So I, I totally understand that. And I think it's something we have to, uh, my mom just brought me some tea. <laughs> so, uh, it's something we have to keep in our mind and we have to be aware of. And that's why, Rick, when you say it, when we travel, it's not only about us, it's about the people there that they also might be interested in hearing our stories because that's their way sometimes to travel is by us mm -hmm. going to their homes and being, visiting them and giving them part of our story as well and see it and give and take. And not only I'm coming to learn from you, but it's both it's both ways. You're going to hear my stories and I'm going to hear uh, your stories. Uh, mm -hmm. But absolutely be aware of your privilege. I think most of us, uh, most of us are not. You know, I think when a lot of people say have a safe trip, they're, they're, they're saying what they really mean is don't shake up your perspective to the point where you forget uh, the, the proper order of things. And I just think a lot of people try to avoid culture shock. And to me, culture shock is a very important dimension of travel. 
especially if you're a privileged person uh, from a privileged country. Uh, you want to get out of your comfort zone. You want to find yourself in a position that challenges all of your um, norms. Uh, culture shock is the growing pains of broadening perspective. And when we seek that out, we are traveling on purpose. And then you don't just get transformed and leave it at that. You have that transformational experience. And then you come home and you implement that as a, active, um, a, as a citizen in your own country. Uh, if, if you really want to be part of the solution. And uh, that's why I just feel like, you know, there's a lot of reasons to question the ethics of travel in a world with so much need, in a world with so much climate change, and we travel, we, we contribute to climate change. And if we had to, I know that there's ways to travel in ways that are um, uh, uh, mindful of the, the uh, contribution that travel makes to climate change. And there are ways to mitigate your carbon when you travel, and we can do that. And that, uh, that's beyond the scope of today's talk, I think. But the point is, when we travel, we become a citizen of the planet. And when we come home, we can, uh, we can implement that new sensibility, and I think make the world a better place. Thank you so much. Um, so I am going to cut us off there. Um, it's so much to unpack in such a short amount of time, um, but that is a good segue into a shameless self promo for Impact Travel Alliance. Uh, we are a global community. Um, we have chapters all around the world. We host events in person and online like this that are really designed to talk about sustainable and impactful travel in a way that is modern, fresh, inclusive, um, and approachable. Um, we are currently beta in beta mode for a new digital community um, where community is able to come together after these events online, um, after our events in person, after reading interesting stuff online. Um, so everyone who is in this event today or has registered, um, you will receive a private invite link to that so that you can join us. Um, we're very excited about it. We've been rolling it slowly out over the year. And of course, um, thank you so much to Aziz. It's always a pleasure to see you. Um, Rick, so great to have your perspective here. We received so many messages of people who were so excited. They were like, oh my God, I can't wait to see Rick speak. Um, and Paige, of course, um, for bringing us all together today. Um, I do have a tradition with our online events to leave our digital mic um, with the speakers. Um, so I'd love to hear any lasting takeaways that any of you would like to share today. I'll, well, I'll, go, go, yep, ahead. go ahead. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll just mention, I, this is so fascinating and so important and, and, and such an inspiration to be able to share the mic with Aziz and uh, to learn about Impact Travel Alliance and to think that we're all contributing to the, the mission of Impact Travel Alliance. We could talk forever. <laughs> I will mention that I've, I've enjoyed making TV shows on public television for 30 years. And I think four of the most important hours that we've produced are the one hour special on Iran, the one hour special on the Holy Land, the one hour special on fascism, and the one hour special on hunger and hope. And you can look at and watch those shows along with everything we've ever produced for free anytime at my website at ricksteves.com. And, and that would be a chance to kind of further share uh, about the points that I've been making uh, and sharing with Aziz during this wonderful hour. So thanks for having me. Yeah, and same, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Travel Impact Alliance. And Paige, thank you so much for just making this happen and for bringing Rick and I together. And I think it's really important for those of us. And unfortunately, I don't think there are as many yet. For those of us who want to change how travel is working, to to work together, to get to know each other more, um, and to be an alliance, just uh, just like happening now, and to learn from each other, and I'm sure I'm learning a lot from your work, and uh, and I hope we can help in whatever way in your work as well. Um, as you said, hopefully you've come to Jerusalem, and I'll show you around, and uh, have you come and eat at my mom's uh, house. But I I, I want to end with don't think of travel as only how far can I go. I think the most important thing to me is to think of travel as just stepping out of my comfort zone and the most impactful travel I've ever experienced were down the street from my house. Mm -hmm. Travel is not distance. It's about how we think, how we interact. And I hope if there's one thing you get out of this, take every note we talked about and think about how to apply it even at home and not only far, far away 
mm. once a year for a week or 10 days. These mm. are principles that can be applied in your neighborhood, in your city, in your country. Oh, beautifully said. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, it was so great to have you all here and I look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great rest of your Friday.